After knowing the types of congenital anomalies, we need to differentiate or we need to understand the pattern in which a congenital anomaly actually appears. So in this section, we'll study three different patterns of congenital anomalies, the syndromes, associations, and sequences. We'll see how we can differentiate a congenital anomaly by looking at the pattern in which an anomaly appears. Starting off with the pattern of multiple anomalies, Whenever there are multiple anomalies that can be seen, it means that they're associated somehow and their association can help us differentiate them uh, into syndrome sequences and associations. Here are some of the examples of multiple anomalies. We'll be discussing them in detail, but for now you can see how there is a syndrome, a girl suffering from Soto syndrome, and then there's an infant with Robin sequence. So we'll see how they both are different on the basis of which factors we actually term one as syndrome and another as a sequence. Syndromes are basically pattern of congenital anomalies of more than one organ systems with a common etiology. It means that whenever we are talking about multiple organs that might be involved, which will lead to an anomaly, we term it as syndrome. Again, uh, with multiple organs, the uh, common etiology should be there for us to uh, differentiate uh, a proper, a particular type of congenital anomaly into a syndrome. Uh, for example, uh, Soto syndrome is basically characterized by overgrowth, macrocephaly, an advanced bone age, a characteristic facial appearance, there's neurodevelopmental and neurobehavioral changes which can be seen, and over 90% of the patients who suffer from Soto syndrome have a mutation in a gene called NSD1. It means that you can see that there are multiple organs that are involved which uh, leads to the syndrome. So the first uh, requirement of a syndrome is fulfilled. There are multiple organs and they have a common etiology. And you can see that there is overgrowth or large structures which, uh, which eventually causes uh, advanced bone age as well. And you can see that even the neurodevelopmental or neurobehavioral changes can be seen. And you can uh, trace that all to a common uh, mutation, which is present in um, the NSD1 gene. So over 90% of the patients who suffer from Soto syndrome will have a mutation in this particular gene. Uh, again, there can be uh, different mutations in this gene, but uh, the common uh, thing that you see here is that there are multiple organs involved. Then the second one uh, is associations. Associations is basically a known occurrence of certain anomalies. Um, these happen too often to be by chance, but without a defined etiology. So this helps us differentiate uh, associations from uh, <clears throat> the syndromes, because you see that in this case, uh, the occurrence of certain anomalies is common which is a difference from the syndromes. And secondly, there is no defined etiology uh, and you cannot actually predict or define how this, uh, this the anomalies or the pattern of anomaly occurs. Um, usually associations are designated by acronyms and the acronyms are basically um, uh, all the problems or all the diseases uh, or all the um, uh, uh, anomalies that a person may suffer and all, uh, all of those can be used uh, or the first letter of those problems or anomalies can be used to designate acronym to um, association. So for example, there is an association known as vectoral association or V-A-C-T-E-R-L association. Um, this is defined because the person or the babies who suffer from vectoral association will have vertebral anomalies, as you can see in the figure. There is uh, anal atresia or the imperforate uh, anus. There is cardiac malformation. There is tracheal esophageal fistula. There is uh, renal anomalies and limb anomalies. 
so when most of these com common uh, problems are present, we term the association or the problem as bacterial association. Association is again different from the uh, syndromes because you see there is no common uh, uh, etiology which you can trace. Uh, moving on to the diagnostic criteria of association, at least three features that I've mentioned here, uh, as you can see here, at least three of these should be present in a patient to be uh, to term uh, his problem as uh, an association. So it's not necessary that all of these factors are present in the patient, but these are certain factors, and uh, out of these, if uh, at least three are present in a person, then we term uh, the patient as a bacterial association. The, the key distinction from syndromes is the lack of common etiology, which I've mentioned earlier. And so whenever you're talking about syndromes or associations, you see that in syndromes, you actually have a particular pattern which you know will be common in in um, all the patients who are suffering from the syndrome and there will be a common uh, etiology but in case of association not all factors will be present in all the patients and it will be uh, there will be lack of an identified common etiology then the next uh, pattern is a sequence sequence is basically um, Development of a person or of an embryo is interconnected. It, we, it means that uh, uh, it, it's not like one organ develops while other stays in a, in a very uh, premature stage. All the development in a person's body uh, is interconnected, takes place at a certain time and uh, may be influenced by the development of certain other organs in your body. So an early change can have a snowball effect on other component. It means that the, a change in one particular um, cell or in one particular tissue might lead to change in other and the other change might lead to change in another. And similarly, the, the pattern goes on and there's a snowball effect which may result in, in, a, in a problem in development of um, an embryo resulting in a sequence. So uh, as the name suggests, sequence means there is an early change in one component and it results in effect on um, the development of another component and it results in effect of development of another component. And it's also interconnected that it creates a snowball effect resulting in a sequence. So there is a cascading effect and there is a pattern of anomalies that can be see, uh, seen in sequence. If you look at the comparison between sequence and association, you see that there is a single localized anomaly in early morphogenesis and this lead to secondary and tertiary anomalies. And there is a pattern of multiple anomalies which can be seen later on in morphogenesis because of that single localized um, uh, anomaly which developed in early morphogenesis. Well, in the case of association, there is a cluster of anomalies that is not explained um, or that is not present there in a particular fashion, in a particular uh, order, and you cannot uh, determine the root cause as well. So multiple anomaly pattern is basically a sequence. So that's how we differentiate sequence from associations and associations from syndrome. The Robin sequence, commonly termed as a Perry Robin sequence, is one uh, example in which there is a one primary anomaly, which is the microognasia or small jaw. Now, all the anomalies that will be present in um, a patient suffering from Robin sequence will be interconnected to this primary anomaly, that is the small jaw. Um, you'll see how they are interconnected. The first one is there will be a displacement of tongue or displaced uh, tongue uh, posteriorly. Again, since the jaw is small, there is a very small space for every organ in there to arrange in the proper fashion. And thus the first factor will be displaced tongue. Then you see, uh, again, whenever we are talking about Robin sequence, um, the stage in which the sequence or the anomaly occurs matter a lot because 
For example, if this occurs before nine weeks of gestation, then you will see that uh, it means that the anomaly occurred prior to the closure of lateral palatine ridges, resulting in an abnormally displaced tongue, uh, tongue, which will physically interfere with the closure of the palate, resulting in a U or wedge shaped palate configuration. And uh, certain other secondary changes might be seen because of malnutrition. Now you you can pretty uh, pretty well imagine and see how they are all interconnected. Before if there is an anomaly before like if there is a small jaw development uh, before nine week of gestation, this means that the uh, palate ridges aren't closed, um, which means that there will be an abnormally displaced tongue. Now the tongue will physically interfere with the closure of the pellet and thus the, the shape of the pellet will be different from the normal pellet shape and will have a more U or wedge like structure. And because of the small jaw, even feeding such a child is uh, hard uh, and because of that malnutrition uh, occurs and there are secondary developmental changes. Um, or uh, there will be growth changes that will, you will see in patients who are suffering from Robin sequence. So you see how everything is interconnected in this and that is why we call it a sequence. So in this section, we covered how we can, uh, on the basis of the pattern in which a congenital anomaly actually um, uh, it appears can help us differentiate between different types of congenital anomalies and the pattern of congenital anomalies or the pattern that they follow uh, can help us differentiate them into uh, syndromes, sequences and associations. So that's all we'll be covering in this section. Thank you for watching Scardia.com.